Um, so I'm, I'm going to take a, <laughs> I've got kind of a big picture here. This is a, um, I'm, I'm looking at endpoints and how we get there. And, and kinetics is, a, is going to be a big part of that, I'm sure. So um, uh, a way to explain it. So some perspective, uh, looking at the, the big picture here, the biggest picture I could find, more or less. Uh, we're all familiar with the Big Bang. Some of us are old enough to remember part of it, I think. Um, uh, I feel that way sometimes. It, the, the universe took a while to make. And uh, you know, if we go back, there's a time began uh, 13 billion years ago. But I converted this to decades for, for using, um, uh, to sort of like see how the net plays out. Because TCPIP came along uh, in the dawn of time before the 80s. And then, and then along came um, early open protocols, the email protocols we're using now, which they didn't catch on immediately. Uh, Richard Solomon came up with the term free software, uh, which Linux used and, uh, and referred to the web as well. That was around 1990. And then shortly after that, uh, five years after that, we had um, ISPs, and that's because we had graphical browsers. Um, that's only 1995. And then open source, the term open source, which by the way, if you look up they, they, you know, a trillion results or something like that on, on Google, we've only been using it since February of 1998. That's when, uh, when Eric Raymond and the Open Source Initiative decided that open source would work better than free software. It's a wonderful example of PR at work. Um, blogging came along roughly in 1998. Steve uh, Weiner came up with uh, RSS about that same time. And now we're talking about the real-time web, which um, uh, my son Alan called the live web about five years ago, but now we actually have it. With, twi with Twitter we have that, although Twitter search is not quite real-time enough yet. It's only beginning. And uh, my friend Bob Frankston, um, there's now, uh, says where we're headed is ambient connectivity. That is where we can connect to anything, anytime we want, wherever we want. And that's really the end state or the infrastructure that we're building. I mean, we're not there yet. But we're headed in that direction. And I need to do something with these other spaces. There's a something I call the giant zeros. I won't unpack, and there's if you want to know that I would have right there. So, uh, but my point, my point is that what we have right now are, you know, a few light elements. It's like three minutes after the Big Bang. You know, we have a few light elements, a lot of heat, and no galaxies yet. And we're we're inclined to think it's the end of time. You know, we're all living on the slopes of a big volcano called Google, and there's all this free stuff coming out of it. We think, oh, this is great. It's all working out. No, it's not. It's dangerous. You know, we get, there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen and has to happen. So, um, and we're stuck in the past in a lot of really critical ways. So, consider the online shopping experience. So, uh, here's the names of a few companies, and here's a shopping cart, which I, is a ubiquitous shopping cart, and the <coughs> shopping site has one. And here's what my what my wife said in 1966. 1966 was when. Um, her sister, one of her many sisters, um, from a big Irish Catholic family, was the VP of finance for a new company called Netscape. And so my wife was not very technical, got technical enough to use Netscape. And e-commerce had just started to come along there with Amazon and a few other companies. And she said something that I thought was profound, which was, why can't I take my shopping cart from one site to another? You still can't do that. <laughs> it's 2009, and you still can't do that. So. Consider terms of service that also haven't changed since 1996. You could read some of that if you feel like it. Um, it's uh, essentially the lawyers have been copying what, what um, Amazon came up with in 1996. You know, nobody even looks at this stuff. You know, uh, and just click accept. You know, and why bother reading something you have to accept, um, and which offer all advantages to the seller because they're the lawyers that wrote the thing. So it's so early now that. And this is a kind of a weird reality distortion that we have right now. It's so early that brick and mortar businesses are adopting what's broken online. Say so we have to get, we have to do what the electric people do. So let's um, let's do loyalty cards. Let's give everybody their own little barcode, but we'll give them their barcode, right? Um, so you you have to become a member and sign in to buy anything, you know. And and single sign in still isn't there. So so what we've done is is taken something is broken in the internet world that we have to become a member to buy anything and put it in the, in the brick and mortar world. And so now the brick and mortar world is getting encumbered. It's crazy. So loyalty cards, I think, are the green stamps of our time. So I don't know how many people remember green stamps. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the biggest press run in history was the 1966 Green Stamps Redemption Book. 
By the way, most green stamps are never cashed in. Um, and the idea behind green stamps is all this stuff, raising switching costs, differentiation, driving loyalty, you know, you know, sound familiar? It's, you know, it's part of the same industrial automation thinking that we've had for a long time, gone wild. So I'm gonna give the example of one uh, fine grocery store called Shaw's that's uh, in Boston. It's, um, it's a really big one of those super stores. I like it because they have a lot of stuff. And you have a fairly good chance of what you're looking for when you go there. We have one of their little loyalty cards on our, uh, on our car key chain, and, and it has all the modern, what I call, inconveniences. So to check out FAST, the shop, if you really want to check out FAST, you have to operate one of these. You say, like, hey, customers, learn to drill press. You know, learn, learn to operate a knee. You know? They're professionals that used to operate these things, right? No, no, you do it. You have to put your groceries through and scan them and bag them, you know, and, 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 and always, by the way, this thing over here, the, 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 the thing that you swipe that used to mean steal, but now it means wipe your car through the thing, it's not even connected very well. The IT systems behind us are completely screwy. And, and so and they always have to have a professional standing nearby to help you out, which happens most of the time, right? It's part of this cool new retail trend of outsourcing customer support to the customer. You know, go to our website. That's what they say all the time. You know, you call somebody for service, call Verizon or something. Oh, go to our website. We've got some cool crap for you on our website. We're going to scrape you up. So, and you have this term experience. This is the new gloss on, on crap, okay? You know, oh, we're going to deliver an experience, you know. This is so, you know, note to sales. When somebody sells an experience to you, think of this. This is my favorite picture, actually. <laughs> Scariest thing I ever saw. It's, uh, it's one of my favorites on, on Flickr. Experience too often means user control, controlling the user one way or another. We're going to deliver an experience that you'll only have with us and not with anybody else. So I, I brought Shaw's up because here's a typical checkout story. This happened a couple days ago. We went to a Shaw's. Um, and we gathered a bunch of groceries, my kid and I, and we went, you know, running around, and my, my wife's out of town, she usually does this, she's, like, she's the cook in the, in the house. And we scan and bag, the kid loves doing this thing, he, he's, he's expert at it, right? We scan and bag the fast checkout thing, and, uh, you know, but we failed to get the Shaw's card discount. We show her a little card, we barcoded it, nothing happened, there's no discount. It's not really a discount anyway, you know, there's a surcharge for the people that don't have the card, right? We all know this. So, we went to customer service, they're nice people there, and we had 20 minutes of our life sucked away, you know, <laughs> while we waited for them to debug the problem. They couldn't get the IT system to figure out even which cash register the receipt came from because the printout from the cash, from the, it's not even a cash register, whatever that was, they printed something out, was missing enough data in it, they sort of guessed at who we were, um, and we got a generous gift card from them, you know, from somebody behind the counter said, who said, we hate this. We actually hate this. We, we would just rather take these things out and put in four express checkout lines, you know. It'll go faster. We know what we're doing. You know, why are they doing this? They don't know, right? And they hate the car little cards, too, because it's a bunch of filling out, and it doesn't even collect good data. You know, you don't have your card. Oh, use mine. It's fine, you know. There's uh, <laughs> a friend of mine, Don Marty, I go ahead and mention later, does a... Uh, is, is part of this little conspiracy that does nothing but use the same barcode and always get whiskey and diapers. <laughs> Just to screw with the system. Yeah, look at whiskey and diapers online. <laughs> Let's see where it goes. So, so why did we learn from the Green Stamps experience? I mean, Green Stamps is a failure, essentially. You know, and the reason is that we've idealized impersonal business. We've done this for 150 years. We've done it ever since industry won the Industrial Revolution. You know, and, and, and it's... You know, we've got this idea that the pyramid runs everything, right? So, so take, for example, something that was really well intended at its time, which is the early 1990s. Um, a guy named Tom Siebel, who created Siebel Systems, which is now part of, um, uh, uh, of Oracle, uh, came up with customer relationship management. You read his stuff, and it's all good sounding stuff. It's very friendly toward people. But if you search for, do an image search for CRM, you come up with these. These are the top three that I found at one point. And you look at the language in here, you know, it's, it's, and you got ways to acquire and control and re retain and manage and otherwise own customers, right? You know, we talk about customers as, as if they were slaves or worse, you know. So here's another picture for the, that I found. You know, this is, this is how CRM works, customer relationship management. You've got competitive positioning, a brand strategy, and a sales.